Hello, I'm Jay Tidwell. I'm the preacher for the Enterprise Church of Christ in Union County, Mississippi, and I'm honored to be able to participate in this year's series of lectures and videos. The topic for this session is the Christian and civil government. I'd like for us to look at this subject in three sections. The first section is the recognition of civil government by the Christian. The second main section is the responsibilities of the Christian towards civil government. And then the third section, we'll look at the restoration movement and the civil government. And in beginning this, we'll look in Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus introduces us this subject, really lays the foundation and, and gives us some principles that guide us through this, this particular subject. And it begins in Matthew 22. I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. It says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. You know, the combination of people who, who approached Jesus in this passage probably would have signaled to everybody there that there was something unusual, something suspicious here. When you've got the Pharisees, who had one extreme view about the interaction with the Roman authorities and discouraged that. And then you've got the Herodians, who were another sect in Judaism in that particular period of time, who encouraged that kind of uh, affiliation. And they come to Jesus with a common question. That sort of signaled that something was amiss. And Jesus, of course, knowing everything that is within everyone, he recognized that there was an ulterior motive behind this particular question. He gives us the first principle for our topic, and that is that we recognize that there is a civil authority or secular authority, and at the same time, simultaneously, that we may and we will as Christians live under a spiritual authority. Now, this was not the first time this particular subject had come up during Jesus' ministry. Earlier in the book of Matthew, if you turn back a couple of pages in your Bible to Matthew chapter 17, it tells us in that chapter, beginning in verse 24, that when they had come to Capernaum, those that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? And Peter saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take, and give unto them for me and thee. Now if we, if we harmonize these two passages, what this does is it shows us a consistent view, and that is, Jesus is establishing for us that we will recognize that there is a civil authority, civil government, and that we would be adhering to its requirements insofar as that was permissible for us as his followers. Now that's just the first general guideline. If we go back through the Old Testament, we can, we can begin in the book of Genesis chapter 9, just after the flood, where the Lord had announced that human government would be utilized and it would be present in order to punish those who were conducting themselves wrongfully. Specifically, the Lord said in Genesis 9 and verse 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And so what God had done is he was demonstrating that those who would execute his laws in this kind of corporal fashion were going to be through the medium of the civil government that would exist and that would be in place upon the earth. And showing that that is one of his recognized institutions for accomplishing those means. Then through other parts of the Old Testament, we see numerous uh, instances where there was a civil government that was present or that was being utilized by God in some way to carry out his will perhaps through the scheme of redemption. And then we have Jesus who's through these 
two passages that we've just noticed recognizing that there may be a government in place, that that government may have a demand such as a financial expectation upon those who are within its power, and that as his followers, we are still expected to comply with those types of requirements. Now that leads us to the second major section, that is, as Christians, our responsibilities toward the civil government. And there's five or six of those specifically that we can see given to us in the New Testament as mandates for Christians. One of these is in Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, this is what Paul gives us by way of instruction. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. He is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they that are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so there in Romans 13, those first seven verses, Paul really goes into the, the rationale for God's giving us the need to be subject to the civil government as his followers, that it is serving a valid and, and heavenly sanctioned purpose by its existence upon the earth. When Paul was also teaching uh, Timothy about the responsibilities that God's people would have toward the civil government, he told Timothy to instruct all those whom he might teach to give supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men in 1 Timothy 2. And then verse 2 says this, to also pray for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so the Lord's expecting us to be praying for those who are the, the leaders through our civil government, through the secular authorities. And then with our general posture and position toward the civil government, wherever we might be as a child of God. In Titus 3 verse 1, Paul said, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Now if we press further through the New Testament, we see Peter echoing these same basic tenets. Notice what Peter says. This is in 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 13. He says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, and whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Peter explains, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And so we see Paul and Peter elaborating on that basic principle that Jesus taught us, that we would recognize the existence of the civil government by explaining that as followers of Christ, that we have a submissive attitude toward it. Of course, all these things are subject to an additional condition that we see Peter describing for us in Acts chapter five, where Peter and John had been told not to preach the gospel of Christ. And this is how Peter responded in Acts five, verse 29. Peter and the other apostles took the position that we ought to obey God rather than men. And that was explaining why they were continuing to preach about Christ, even though they had been forbidden to do so. Now, with all these different areas of responsibility that we share as Christians toward the civil government, wherever we might be, what that lets us know is that we need to be informed about its conduct. We need to be informed about our responsibilities toward it, because there is a way in which our faithfulness to God is tied to the way that we submit ourselves to the secular authority. Those were specific affirmative instructions that we have for us as God's people in the New Testament. There are a lot of issues, especially in the United States, that, that call for study, calls for us to be um, informed and educated about it. It also calls for us to be people because of the freedoms we have that we'll be a, a qualified and registered voter and that we can, we can express our choices about how issues ought to be handled through our secular government. 
And so let's think about the third section, and that is the restoration movement and the civil government. In taking into account those basic principles that we've already considered and, and Jesus' fundamental foundation that there's a secular authority and a spiritual authority, it does make for an interesting study to go through the restoration movement and to see how these men were drawing conclusions about how we should interact with the civil government, especially when you consider some major events that were taking place, especially things like the Mexican War and, and even the Civil War, of course, that really drew things close to home during the Restoration Movement. One of the great pieces of writing that we should be familiar with on this subject during that time period is David Lipscomb's book on civil government. Just taking a few excerpts from his book, listen to the different ways that he expresses this sort of position. He says, the higher power is a revenger to execute wrath on him that doeth evil, referring to, to Romans 13. The Christian has been clearly forbidden to take vengeance or execute wrath. But he is to live peaceably with all men to do good for evil. Then a Christian could not be an officer or executor of this higher power. You go to another place, like on page 79, he says, But as no higher or closer relation than submission is required towards civil government, all the Christian can do in that relation is to refrain from active antagonism and conflict and to quietly and passively submit within the prescribed limits. But no limitation of obligation or license to participate in or in any wise fellowship and support is found. So there is a, a, a distinct line that he draws in his position regarding our interaction with the civil government that would basically say that we should not have any voice that we express within it. We cannot be a participant within it to carry out any of its agenda. Now, he gives some rationale for this by referring to the, the circumstances we see about some of the, the individuals in the New Testament. For example, he says this, page 116. Neither Matthew, nor Paul, nor Cornelius, nor the jailer, nor Erastus held office after becoming Christians. They could not have retained office because first, the end of the church of Christ which they entered and the principles of the religion which they embraced forbid it. Second, the government in which they held office was seeking through persecution to exterminate the Christians as private citizens, much less could it honor them as its representatives and the executors of its laws. Third, they could not have held these offices because the special duties they would have been required to perform were utterly abhorrent to the Christian. They would have been called upon to persecute, imprison, beat, and even put to death men and women whose only crime was believing in Jesus as the Lord and Savior. No Christian can hold an office which imposed such duties. Now, of course, these are some very strong views, and this was a very distinct position that Lipscomb had about the Christian's interaction with the civil government. You have to respect the, the means by which he came to these kinds of conclusions, and by that I mean he was seeking to confine himself strictly to the teaching of the New Testament what I, I think also we have to observe about some of his conclusions, though, is it might have overlooked some significant details about some of those individuals, for example, that, that were mentioned there. And it might also have gone too far in addressing perhaps some hypothetical situations. Let's take, take some of those, for example. He mentioned several individuals like Matthew, Paul, Cornelius, the, the jailer at Philippi, he's referring to Erastus, and says that they did not hold office after becoming Christians. We don't have any specific details that they did not hold office. Uh, so that is an affirmative statement that, that goes a little bit further perhaps than the actual text that we have. As a matter of fact, we don't have any information that any of these characters were ever expressly told to leave their position uh, or that they resigned when they became a Christian or could not exercise the, the roles of those particular secular positions. As a matter of fact, if you look in Acts chapter 16, for example, the Philippian jailer, after he was baptized, after he became a Christian, uh, Luke refers to him as the keeper of the jail in Philippi after he had been baptized and was a child of God, Acts 16 and verse 36. And also in Romans 16, 23 refers to Erastus in a favorable way, describes him as the chamberlain of the city. And then in, if you look, like, for example, in Luke chapter 3, perhaps that addresses some of the other concerns that Lipscomb expressed when he talked about the things a Christian could not do that instead of a Christian being forbidden from holding any of these kind of positions, it may be more of a, what the Christian may do in carrying out those particular roles. For example, in Luke chapter three, when there were some soldiers who came to John the Baptist and they were inquiring about how they could demonstrate repentance in their life, what John told them was this. John said, uh, do violence to no man, Luke three, verse 14. Neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. 
So John did not even direct for these particular individuals to abandon their post in order for them to express repentance. So from a logical standpoint and from a, a scriptural standpoint, there is not an instruction that tells us that we must abstain from any involvement with any type of civil government. Instead, we're told to submit to it. We're told to pray for it. And we also are able to enjoy the benefits of it. If you, if you look through the book of Acts, there are several places in there where we're given information about Paul's utilizing his rights as a Roman citizen. And he coupled that with the mission that God gave him to preach the gospel. And so while he was appealing the charges that were raised against him about the disturbances he was allegedly creating regarding preaching the resurrection of Jesus, Paul was utilizing his rights in a legal and secular sense to uh, proceed through the, the Roman courts. And so we see that the Christian is able to observe these kinds of privileges and rights within a secular government, and that they're also able to enjoy the benefits of that. They're, they're expected to comply so far as we can, consistent with the will of God in every other respect, and that we're expected, if it requires us, to pay tribute or, or the taxation uh, that may be asked to fund those kinds of things. And so to take the extreme view that we can enjoy the benefits of freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and enjoy the protections of the secular government, but that we're not permitted to participate in it in any kind of way as a child of God is a, is a lot like saying a person wants to be in the lifeboat, but they don't want to have to row. It's a matter of good stewardship as a child of God that we would facilitate the worthwhile goals and the respectable goals of our civil government in order for us to have a quiet and peaceable life and to lead it in godliness and honesty, to enjoy those freedoms of speech and religion that enable us to, to serve the Lord as we desire to today. This is just a great subject for our study. In the United States of America, we have so many different issues that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis that are calling upon us to make difficult decisions sometimes as children of God. What we have to remember is the Lord's never in His Scripture given us any kind of instruction about the specific type of government that He might want us to, to implement as His children. Same thing is true with the types of economic policies and procedures or the social structure. So He's expecting us to use the, the wisdom given to us and the principles given to us in Scripture to be good and faithful stewards in that way and to always in every instance to honor and exalt Him as the one who is king of kings. As God's children, what we remember is that Jesus has a kingdom that is not of this world. What we're always doing, no matter where we are, we are serving the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention.